Well, I just recently finished up my typical January client trip, which is 10 clients in 11 days, and that was over in Ohio. I'm using Ohio every January, May, and September. And then uh, Michigan, I'm out for four months, and then uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota for three months. So we're really strict about those trips. Um, we're actually, I'm planned out all the way through September now. Um, so all those spots are filled. I will fill a few random spots, maybe June, July, August in um, you know Minnesota, Wisconsin, close to home, maybe one a week here or there. But other than that, schedule's full. Schedule's full for myself. Uh, Dylan might book a few around Wisconsin, uh, close yep. to Stevens Point. Yep. More like uh, summertime. Yeah, I'm looking at like the end of May, June, and certainly July. So if you're in that area, holla at you, boy. <laughs> so we can still fill some spots. And of course, we have Kevin Smith uh, that'll be booking clients over Ohio, Pennsylvania. And uh, you'll hear about, a lot more about him uh, very soon. So, but that being said, I wanted to go over a complex parcel design with you. This is one of my Ohio clients. It was actually the last one that I visited uh, in January. And I thought it was a good one because it illustrates a lot of concepts that I've been teaching and originated for a long time. And uh, actually most of the concepts that were in my, are my first book, uh, White Till Success by Design, that was 2012. So I want to hit some of these concepts and, and What's interesting, there's a lot of concepts on this property that will apply to yours, and I know they will. And uh, they're very important concepts that you need to manage with. Um, it doesn't matter if you're putting in a lot of food plots or not, or if you're baiting, in this case, they have bait and food plots down in Ohio. Uh, the bottom line is these concepts have to be followed in order for you to be successful. I'm not saying there's an, not another way to do this, but this is a way it works that works, and it's very important. This is how Dylan manages with these concepts. We expect Kevin to do the, the same thing and anyone else that works with us. In fact, um, that's mandatory um, because these work, and, uh, and I want to bring these to you too. So this design, instead of showing you the typical HuntWise map, an aerial photo, and trying to draw on that and, and showing you a finished design, I thought it'd be better if we put the pieces together like this, and then I'll change them over. This is before right here so make sure you you see this you know this is before on this and and then we'll show you an after here pretty soon so i want to talk about some of the things we are changing this is a beautiful property in fact this property actually had a buck die on it several years ago uh, that was a famous ohio buck i want to say it was 245 scored about 245 246 so we're talking a giant buck and so obviously the area has potential they even had a buck there that was similar uh, this year um, in this location, I would say it was in the 180s to 190. It was just a younger version of that big one. So who knows what it's going to blow up to this year. They didn't hear of anyone shooting it. So it's a, it's a property I love to go to because it has a lot of potential. They're hardcore serious hunters and habitat people, and they've already implemented and started working on the design right away. A lot of that had to do with access or depth of cover. So we're going to go through this. And, and really, I described this. The, everything you see in red here is the cover, some form of cover. Now, there were wood lots, there were open wood lots. I'd like to see them get timbered. There's wood lots that they need to cut and actually drop some timber so you can get canopy to the ground. In this case, they had mature timber, uh, some junk oak, and then they had some hickory. They had some other trees that they could cut down that were non-desirable hunting trees or mass production or mass quality trees. So great trees to cut, get sunlight to the ground and thicken. So we, we had a spot, we were, this is actually it could be 30 acres, it could be 500. In this case, it was 235 acres. When we were here, and we're looking across, deer were vacating the property. And you could see them in the snow. So we're watching 500 yards away, and we're driving through on the ATV. And I remember um, the owner of the land had said, well, we drive our ATVs around, they don't spook deer. We bring feed out, because they can run feeders in Ohio. And we went right through here, and they were pretty shocked because most people don't drive around right now while there's three or four inches of snow on the ground that we're pushing deer literally off the property they're exiting off that fence line because when you spook deer they go a half mile away so we had just rounded the corner up on this bluff right here and looked across the woods and watched those deer exit we weren't even a quarter mile from them and they're gone and that's what happens most of the time with ATVs and it was a cool illustration because they were just a bunch of does and fawns can you imagine that mature buck he was probably already gone he exited stage left as soon as you heard the ATV so the red areas and then they had these areas right here that were in hay just big open hay fields they let the farmer farm it for free you know just hay so they thought that was a good thing and then a cornfield over here now, some of the negatives with that, these black areas are stand locations and a lot of those had feeders associated with them. 
The dots are their access points. Now on one hand, this was their main sanctuary right here, but they would hunt this, feeders right here with wind blowing away. They would hunt this, feeder right here with wind blowing from the outside of that feeder. They would travel through here, scent blowing this way. They had a feeder here, they had a feeder here waiting for deer to come off, scent blowing this way. By the time you add it all up, there wasn't an area on the property that was true sanctuary because a true sanctuary, you can't have an area where deer hear a hunter, see a hunter, or smell a hunter. So by the time you access, even though you can determine this is your sanctuary, that's not enough. I mean, you're looking at even if the deer couldn't see them, hear them, or smell them in that area, we're talking 15, 20 acres at best out of 235 acres. But the point was they could see them, hear them, and smell them uh, coming in, especially with a lot of the ATV use. So really, 235 acres was zero sanctuary. And, and that was the unfortunate aspect of this. And they knew they could do a better job. That's why they're, they're contacting me. But I would say the average property we go to, and I would say the the vast majority of parcels out there, they might have a, a, a destination that they're hunting and they're blowing their wind back and once they get there, they're spooking deer to get there and they might be watching a feeder, a food plot, an oak flat, whatever it might be, they're keeping their scent off there but they're blowing their scent back into other cover that they just went through. By the time you add it all up, there's no acres of efficiency for that parcel that are working for all deer all the time because even though they're watching this area, another stand is blowing out the deer or access to that stand is blowing out the deer that would come to that location that they're watching. I call that depth of cover. What I mean by that is you have a food source here, food, 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 food. A mature buck, <clears throat> you get in an area like this where there's true four, five, six year old bucks, they don't want to bed within a couple hundred yards of those feeders. They have other options. They don't have to put up with the stress of deer accessing those all the time. And then the, the ATV use going in there to fill those feeders all the time. So even if bucks come to this, which mature bucks do, they're coming to largely at night because they're coming over here. You have low pressure here, low pressure here, low pressure over here. So all of a sudden you see a buck come to a feeder from this direction. Well, he's probably living a half mile, three quarters of a mile over here. That's why he's coming in the middle of the, the night. Same with over here. They're just simply off the property. And the problem is in most locations, not everyone has the same goals of herd management. And there's nothing wrong with that. I had a comment this morning on YouTube, kind of ticked me off a little bit. I didn't respond this way, but they were saying, you know, part of the problem is someone doesn't see a buck for seven years, so they shoot the first spike that goes by. Folks, it's not a problem. If the person hasn't seen a buck for seven years, let them shoot that and enjoy it. And then best of all, they didn't burn a tag on one of the bigger ones around. So there's nothing wrong with that. They're happy and they didn't burn a tag on a buck you want to shoot. So what's wrong with that? Seriously, think about it. I don't like the mentality that people can't shoot whatever they want and enjoy it. If they're happy about it, let them shoot it. Who cares? The problem is in most situations, people don't share the same goals. And so what happens is you don't have these low pressure areas that feed a mature buck through during the rut. This becomes more of a rut only parcel because they have lots of food, they have lots of does, there's a lot of commotion, so it keeps deer, the mature bucks off, but those mature bucks have a chance of coming through either late season on a food source, maybe a feeder, or they might come through during the middle of the night. So really, I want these people right here to not only have a great rut, but I want them to have a great October, November, and December. I want them to have experience the entire hunting season, and in this case in Ohio, January too. So there's a lot of hunting to be had without just relying on late season muzzleloader in January or maybe the intense portion of the rut on November 10th, November 15th, hoping that something comes up from there, there, uh, another area. Because whether you have 30, 40 acres, or in this case, 235, there are plenty of acres to create enough depth of cover and a large enough sanctuary on the property. And we'll talk about that percentage of sanctuary when I'm finished, but there's plenty of area, whether you have a smaller parcel or a large, to do a lot better job in this case, I could honestly say there's probably zero acres out of 235 that are for all deer all the time. That means there's no place a mature buck can call home, not seeing ATV going by, not smelling a hunter, not hearing a hunter going to the stand, and that's a problem. And that's why you could have a 40 acre parcel over here that was low pressure, be the herd influencer in the other area, in the area because they're the ones that will collect those the daylight attention of mature bucks. People say, well, Mature bucks have a home range of three square miles, but not during the daylight. That's including 
darkness too. They have a very small home range during the daylight. They want to live within two, 300 yards or they wouldn't make it to an older buck. They're not crossing many property lines to get to a feeder down here in that case and exposing themselves to hunter roads and everything else. So you look at some of these feeders, you know, a feeder right here, it's pulling deer from over here because they're accessing right here. So those deer largely aren't coming from their property to get to that feeder, they're coming from outside the property. That means you're putting deer on a neighbor's property during daylight. They get to hunt those deer 90% of the daylight, you get to hunt them 10%. I see that a lot, that's why it's typically bad unless it's in a defined movement to put food on a border and place those deer that hit that food source on the neighbors because you have zero control. You're not gonna help your hunt, you're not gonna help your herd. You're putting your hands and your goals and dreams into someone else's uh, whims and wishes when it comes to if they wanna shoot that buck or not. Bottom line is, not a lot of acres left over for what's going on. And then the cornfield. It's a cornfield that they, they let a local farmer come in and plant with the thought that, that corn's gonna be a good thing for the deer. But the farmer does cut the corn and every time they leave their cabin right here and walk down to hunt a lot of this major area, even if they're going out back, they can see that cornfield. The deer in the cornfield can see them. So they're constantly spooking deer off that corn. They're coming into that cornfield after it's cut, then they spook those deer. So that cornfield is actually a huge deterrent for deer, let alone these big open hay pasture fields. I wanna say out of the 235 acres, there was around 80 acres of hay in open area. And all those areas were intersected with hunters. So imagine those woods that are adjacent to that hay field. Those deer don't wanna bed within that first 50, 100 yards because they're used to seeing hunters walk by or access through those fields, let alone drive through with an ATV. So then you take it to where just on field access and lack of screening, and deer that might be 50 to 100 yards off that edge. I look at it like, I look at a property like this like a kid in a candy store because there is so much opportunity. The potential right now on that property is a one, one and a half out of 10. I wanna bring it to a 10 out of 10. And, they're sort of, they're, and I always tell clients in this case here, they have no idea how, how good it can be. They, I have higher expectations for them than they do themselves because they haven't seen how it can be when you do it right and how they set aside these acres and have a true sanctuary and realign the food. So I'll go through you know, access, pretty poor food plots, some big food plots, but they're in the center of the property. They can't possibly hunt those or get to those without spooking deer downwind or as they access that food, those food plots. So a lot of things need to be done. Even a feeder right here, those deer can come from that. They do largely stay off that heavy hunting pressure. In fact, Landowners tell me he can see someone in a stand location right about there and the deer will all come from the non-hunting neighbor here off the property on again in the afternoon evening. So his stand is right here looking at a feeder blowing the scent into the property. So you're, you're literally blowing out 150 to 200 yards downwind any direction away from that feeder. So you could be destroying 15, 20 acres just by accessing that stand and getting to it, if not 40 acres. Because once you spook deer, they run a half mile. They don't run just 200 yards, turn around and stop. So a situation like that, you know, coming from the inside, hoping deer come from the outside and stay off the heavy hunting neighbor, which they are. The neighbor's usually there hunting with whatever wind and it's kind of an open property. So they stay off that property. So there's a lot of things that can be done different greatly underutilized there's a there's actually a road that cuts through here this is an upper bluff really nice road for tree stands and access with meaning a, a two track or a field road logging road and then the actual hard top road is on the outside up a bluff so very easy to get in and out here in the morning wait for deer to come back but really at that point because deer are being spooked off these food sources early in the morning when hunters access deer are just passing through this area so not really holding so if they're going to go in there and hunt in the morning right now without changing things they're spooking a lot of deer because those deer are not used to being pestered as they're going across to this pressure or this property on the other side and then passing through so they're just in the middle of the movement right at daybreak. And we wanna keep that movement at daybreak more centralized so on the outside of that movement where actual bucks bed and not the does. So a lot of times getting in the middle of that doe pressure going back and forth and no really good AM and PM stand locations. You know, you can come to a stand like this and say, well, that's a good PM spot because deer are coming through here. And that's a food source. You're relying on deer that are put on your neighbors. And even though they're no hunting neighbor, 
they're not really building or holding so there's no good food over there. there's no food plots it's open woods yeah the deer can go back there and bed but there's no reason for them to stay there so the deer that go on there release from there during the daylight often and get shot so it's lowering the overall um, age structure of the area in a case like that so there are Decent stand, you come to this stand right here, you blow your scent back into the property, you wait for deer to come out here. Obviously an evening stand. But where's a morning stand here? You can't get to any of these stands in the morning without the, the prospect of shooting deer. And so a lot of times a property like this, people start hunting evening only, or they're hunting a lot of evenings, or they're hunting all day during the rut, hoping that what they spook in the morning will eventually settle down by mid-morning, early afternoon, and they'll have a good hunt. So we're gonna make some changes to this, and I'll, I'll show you what we did and why and of course this this involves a lot of discussion you know they're not getting any money from income on the hay uh, they're, they're doing that for free the corn they were getting no income they were just having the farmer plant the corn so they'd have a better hunt which was actually hurting them so it's not a decision of money I, I work with a lot of clients where they'll say okay we have 80 acres of hay um, we'll, we'll, we'll convert 40 of that or half of that. You just tell us where to convert it. In this case, they were it was more of a blank slate, which is what I liked the most. Because as in one of our videos that we're creating actually today, we'll talk about how if you need the income from CRP or ag to pay for your land, you're better off selling that portion of your land, maybe holding 25% back that you can actually put in dedicated whitetail habitat. And there are far better investments that you can make with those dollars that were dedicated for ag or CRP that you had to rent out or enroll in CRP to pay the taxes or to pay the property. In fact, buying income producing properties, rental properties, storage units, car washes, whatever it might be, there's that factor of several times more potential of income if you're really just looking at, okay, I have $160,000 invested into this 40 acres of ag and it's bringing me a return of $40 times 125 an acre. So you're literally getting about $5,000 in income on a $160,000 property per year. It's a really bad return compared to other things that you can invest your money in as far as just looking at overall income versus the overall expense of that. Take that $160,000, put it in something a little bit better um, that give you a return. If you're looking for a true income producing property, which is what you're using the ag and crp for so in this case no constraints and so we're going to make some uh, severe changes to access food and then i'll talk a little bit about what we're doing the timber in these locations too and why you know again this is more open timber right up here open timber in back through here along the road some open conifer cover which is great by the cabin because they can access through that conifer without spooking deer they're not bedding there and then a lot of strip mining around here went into place there's a lot of early successional growth really thick cover and it's at that stage where it's at that perfect stage where there's a lot of browse still but it's open enough for the deer to walk through there are some there are some years in there where it's so thick the deer couldn't even move through it so now they're being able to move through it and it holds some deer so let's make some changes okay now this is after and this is after considering depth of cover access and am and pm stands how that would all relate to each other and there's some stands that aren't here you know around these edges or at certain funnels or pinch points but i want to give you the general idea but bottom line is this right here is a level efficient. We've filled in all this cover. Feeders up here to the outside in the woods because they want to keep using the feeders. And then food plots around here, small hunting plot, small hunting plot, and then three main big plots. And this one down here will end up probably four to five acres, a couple acres here, a couple acres here, probably quarter acre, quarter acre at the most. Um, this is not food in there. So, and then filling this in with cover, and I'll talk you about what those cover portions are. But now they're keeping this, you know, remember we were here, and even there, that area was invaded on that, quote, sanctuary that might have been 15, 20 acres. Now they're sanctuary, really, and I'm not going to draw this out because I know it'll mess it up a little bit. It's probably too messy to understand right now anyways, but if you draw a circle around here from stand to stand, that is that area in the middle now that is all deer all the time. Now, obviously, if they shoot a deer, they're going to go in there and get it. I encourage people to go in after dark if it's cool enough. Keep your voices down, machine running. That's perfect. Deer seem to be very resilient to accessing the land with vehicles after the, under the cover of darkness compared to doing the same thing during the day. Especially so many people go out there on opening day of gun, they're shooting a few does, and they go out there and spook their entire property off getting some does and blow their whole property in one hour of access. So really bad to do. In this case, that's their sanctuary right there. 
off-season work from the day the season ends all the way up until about a month before the season begins, do anything you want, hiking, shed hunting, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, whatever you want to do, no problem, ATV riding, you're not going to spook the deer because mature bucks shouldn't be there in the first place. This property should be thick enough that bucks don't want to crash their velvet in during the summertime in the cover, and then all the food options should be out of there during the summer so you're not trying to create this giant doe herd that takes up space. And that was a part of it too. They had a lot of does and fawns. You can imagine they were running about five feeders, and with those five feeders, tracked a ton of does and fawns, they're running them almost year round. They create that culture of does and fawns in the land and the bucks just stay off the property. It happens time and time again. And you can't say, well, I'll just rely on the rut because bucks don't want to go someplace. They haven't been the rest of the year and don't enjoy the rest of the year just for one week of the rut. They're already established somewhere else. Their sanctuaries everywhere else, their food sources. And so the ones that do come over during the rut are a very small percentage or just a fraction of the potential of mature bucks that could be on the land otherwise. So in this case, a lot of, a high percentage. So if you look at that line around there, this interior that's now all cover, and I'll talk about how we filled that in, then that's gonna represent at 235 acres, I would say 170, 160, but well above 50%. If you don't have 50% efficiency even on 20 acres, something needs to be redesigned, meaning that area that there's no hunter scent sounder site within that area during the deer season. Now, obviously they might even need to go in here and plant some food plots in the middle of September, you know, a couple of weeks before the season begins or the third or fourth week of September. That's okay, you know, going in there with a tractor, you have to plant your food plots. That's one of those give take portions where you have to access and even if you spook off deer or a mature buck for two or three weeks, that's okay because you have to get those food plots planted. And one of the things too, I stress the importance, they had food plots, but they're all planted in different plantings and that's a bad thing. So let's say this was in brassica, this was in beans, this was in corn, this was in clover. Well, depending on what's peaking at the moment, those mature does will slot over to that food source and leave other portions of the land vacant. That means bedding areas, water holes, funnels, pinch points, deer travel is not being used because the bulk of the deer herd is sliding over to the side. Still being hunted, they're just not seeing those deer because they're not there, because they're cheating to one side and you can only fit so many does and fawns into an area. Does and fawns, especially does, are more bullies than bucks. But when you combine everything in one spot, you limit the number of deer you have overall and certainly the number of the mature bucks. It'd be no different than if these were one, two, three, four, five different feeder locations. Think about this, five different feeder locations here, but you only put feed in one location for three weeks. The other ones are vacant, the other four. And so they rotate this one to here, then you rotate it here, then you rotate it over there, then you rotate it over there. That's what some people do with their food plot programs when they're planting different food plot varieties in different food plots. Basically, you're taking all the deer and trying to slam them over into this one spot when it's maturing and attracting at that time of the hunting season for that three week period. Because that's what food plots offer, you know, that three to five week window where they really train. And that's why you want to have all those varieties implanted in one spot. So we talked about that in this location, getting food plot varieties that would last. A lot of times a brassica blend works great if the deer will eat it in your area, which they do in most areas, especially when you have more of a candy crop of late planted beans, late planted peas, maybe oats, rye top dressing that and then you have the brassicas on one side you can sweeten the brassicas with beans and peas but bottom line is the brassica provides a lot of volume for later and if you have the early season candy crops it creates a lot of diversity within the same food plot for food that's maturing early and late so that it doesn't wreck those patterns of food plot use that you want deer to use utilize the entire season not just for five six weeks at a time so that was part of it but then filling in here, they have a high percentage of efficiency of the land. Instead of zero acres out of 235 being dedicated to all deer all the time, they have 160 to 170, and it's complemented well with quality cover and quality food. And that's where people don't understand the importance. Who cares that there's a five-year-old buck in there that never comes out to a food source before, before dark for you to shoot them or running around an edge or back in one of these morning stands. You have them, you advance them to the next year, to the next age class is even bigger, but you gave them a place to live. Most people don't have even close to a place for a mature buck to live and that's why they're not herd influencers. That's why they're not influence anything except just building a deer herd full of does and fawns. So in this case, they have that cover. Now what we did is there's a, there's a pretty big solid stretch of food in here. Let's take that middle half, 50%, convert it all to switchgrass. 
Let the grass grow up in early successional growth around it. Keep it all mowed if you have to, the early successional growth. You can always maintain that as a field for the foreseeable future, but that allows for you to have a browse component next to that thick switch. It's awesome for pheasants, rabbits, let alone whitetails. So we can do that here. Here is a nice food plot. It's already chemically controlled, easy to frost seed switch grass onto, just like this area. Just turn it all into switch. Pretty easy because you have early successional growth that you can create around it. These blue areas, these big blue areas, those are the areas where I'd like to see switchgrass pockets. I'd like to see those areas 20 feet wide all the way around that field. Let's feel that field might be 40 acres, 35 acres at least, but you're putting switchgrass 20 feet around all the way around. And then on the inside, you're creating switchgrass pockets to the tune of about 40, 50% of the area. Then the rest, use your imagination. If you want to plant shrubs, if you want to let it go to early successional growth, if you want it the expense of pollinator blends for forbs, forages, various weebs, bee balm, goldenrod, ragweed, whatever you want to put in there, milkweed, then you can put that in there too. But just like food plots, it needs to be consistent. So whatever you do here, you do here and you do here. Very important. These total blacked out areas, those are those areas of switchgrass. I'd like to see solid switchgrass. This is a big hub for hunters to be able to come through and access this without going all the way around to the road. So once they develop that switchgrass, they can just slip through the backside. And the thing about solid switchgrass is where you have diverse habitat and bedding cover on the inside, not as much reason for them to bed in that switchgrass because there's not a food component. They need to eat three times during the daylight hours, that third time being these high quality food plots. So I wanna be able to access through that switch with a very low probability that I'm, that I'm spooking any deer. And sometimes even if they're 20 feet away and you're being quiet and you have a mowed trail right on the outside of the switch, you can get right down. Here I'd like them to leave at least 10 feet of switch adjacent to the neighbor's field. So any deer that are out in these, these fallow fields, not really high quality fields, but they could slip along this edge and not spook deer on the neighbors, let alone their own property. It's the same here. You wouldn't go right along the edge. You'd go in 10 feet and then you'd create that mowed trail down the side so you can get in and out without spooking deer. So now you have this whole area, this area and these strip areas. I want them to be very aware of when that browse is starting to get to our head high and higher and the deer aren't staying in there because it's starting to turn in more into pole timber. That's when they get a forestry mulcher or a fecon head and go in there. They could cut down pockets just a quarter acre at a time to encourage that early successional growth. And even if it gets so thick that deer can't move through it, they have a food source all the way around that. So in an area like this, let's say that's 30 acres, they could go in there and make 10 quarter acre pockets. Six, seven years later, they can do the same. Six, seven years later, they can do the same. This is something you can keep managing for the long term. Up here, they had mature timber in these portions right here. So on the map, I shade that out different for them. So that might be brown, let's say. So we'll, we'll talk about brown. We might talk about that for 15 minutes. But they had mature canopy trees that are junk undesirable timber species, or they are twisted, forked, they're non-timber species. Great to cut down, leave the tops, take some out for firewood if you want, or leave the logs down, but not make it so thick in these areas that deer can't utilize them and move through. Really like them to connect these dots. So I wanna see a deer trail. There's already deer trails in these locations. So I wanna see them enhance these deer trails and create them. This is that long interior road that was just 12, 14 feet wide, perfect for a little clover trail going through there. If they didn't wanna put a clover trail, they could put a scrape in front of a stand right there put a scrape where it comes out into the food plot, they can watch with this blind location, put a camera on it, seeing what's living in there. But you connect the dots. You connect the dots from where they go into this wood lot. You wanna turn them. That's why I want this food plot parallel to the border. I want this feeder here, that feeder, that feeder, because then it's encouraging the deer to travel this way, especially those mature bucks. The does just go to a feeder, then after dark they go, go wherever. Those bucks are the ones that'll go around that outside. They're not gonna go a whole loop. They'll come out, you want them to turn left or right, in a case like this, hit a water hole, a feeder, a food plot, and they have that line of movement that keeps them parallel to your borders instead of shooting on and off your borders, which is what's been happening lately. So you're creating parallel habitat movements, movements parallel to the borders. That way the deer that are coming from inside, it's an inside out property, meaning deer are living on the inside now, not out. They come from the inside, go out, they turn left or right, instead of going straight across the fence line over to the neighbors. That allows you to maintain and control those deer more during the daylight hours. All right, just say a real quick point about this. It seems like while you're being real competitive, which you are, but you're trying to build your own daylight deer herd. Now, it'd be incredible 
if the neighbor over here would do the same, the neighbor over here would do the same. Because then they're each building their own daylight deer herd, there'll be some overlap, but the amount of mature bucks in the area would skyrocket. And that would be an incredible thing. And if they're not managing for too many does and fawns by having too much summer food, they can create an exceptionally balanced whitetail herd that we're trying to do here in Minnesota and give you that ability to see many more times more bucks than does during the course of the season as it relates to individual deer. So after we have this area and you have a high percentage of, this is a true sanctuary in there, 170 acres out of 235 or 160, true sanctuary. A true sanctuary includes the food plots. What's the most important aspect of a sanctuary? The food. It has to be protected all the time because if you're spooking deer off this food, they're not bedding in here at all. If you're spooking deer off this food plot, they're not bedding here. If you spook them here, they're not bedding here. You end up with a bunch of does and fawns. You can't spook these food sources unless you shoot them. That's the whole goal. If you're not shooting deer every day, that you access the land. So you're maintaining a low amount of pressure on those food sources. That's the most important aspect of a sanctuary. And then that trickles into the woods. So then these central areas in this cover and these back areas, these morning stands become mostly all buck bedding all the time because you're giving the does the opportunity to bed near this food and you're creating the habitat to do so. So lots of different ways to, to fill this in, you know, solid switchgrass, switchgrass and early successional growth. You want solid switchgrass. That's why you want pockets. That's why you want lines of switch. Because if you dilute that switch by adding other grasses, it'll fall down during the winter time. That's not adding any cover sometimes in November, December with a heavy wet snow. If you put too much food value in there, then there's not enough cover value. If you put too much cover, there's not enough food and that's why you plant the cover separate from the food that's why there's no certain mix do all mix that you just plant and everything's good instead pockets a switch surround the fields and switch now you have dedicated am and pm stands pm stands that relate more to food think about it if if you think getting into that stand in the morning you have the likelihood of spooking deer meaning buy a big food plot then it's a it's an evening stand something you watch the deer there we have a, a stand location, blind location like that, that we might set up this year, I was talking to Dylan about, where we can get in there without spooking deer during the daylight, three o'clock in the afternoon. We can never go in there in the morning. We might be able to wait till an hour after light and slip into it. But to get out, we have to wait for the deer to leave and go to the ag fields. And so, but we can see that in the afternoon, evening. We can't see that in the morning, we're going in blind. In the afternoon, we've watched deer come into a food source. We've watched them exit. They're still there at dark. We have to wait a little bit and then get out. So we have that luxury of already being there. You can't do that in the morning. So where you can spook deer in the morning, it becomes an evening only stand. Because again, you can't spook deer off these plots. That gives you stands that could be more morning and evening. This is one behind the house. There's no deer between the access from the cabin to that feeder and that stand location because it's all open conifer. So you can access that stand pretty easily in the evening or morning not spooking deer because they're all by the big food sources. This line all the way around here, you could access in the morning because deer are largely centered around these big food sources, especially in the form of does and fawns. Mature bucks during the rut, they're around those does and fawns and social areas when it's daybreak. So you can access more in the back. Some of these are pure morning stands because there's a likelihood that deer are bedded around those areas. You have that luxury when you go there in the morning, wait for them to come back. You've been sitting there for four hours. You can see if deer are passing by where they're bedded and you can more safely and easily get out of that stand without spooking deer. Same with an all morning stand back here. You're back here, it's actually all thick cover. You can get into that off the road in the morning. You can't get into that in the afternoon because again, if you're going in the afternoon, you're going in blind. You don't know what's there again in the morning because I get asked this all the time. It's almost like people just can't accept it that they can do this, but you have designated morning stands. Your downwind's covered. You can get into the stand. Now, yeah, deer might be bedded down, but they usually get up twice during the daylight hours before going to their food plots that third time of the, that third feeding of the day. And you can watch them. You can see that they're passing by. You can see where they're bedded. You might even be able to sneak down the stand. So you have a lot of luxury there to be able to get out of that stand at 11 o'clock in the morning versus going in there blind at two or three in the afternoon. Then you have some just pure evening stands, you know, right relating to food. And then there's some that overlap back and forth through here. A couple water holes in those dry areas back there. There's a lot more water down in the center of the property. So even though there's water on the property, a buck that's cruising out here isn't gonna go all the way in to get water and go all the way back. That's why a great a water hole right there, water hole right there. And you have to remember this is all open cover. The reason the deer are bedding up here on this no hunting open cover, open hardwood parcel 
because they didn't have a choice because they were being kicked out of here. Now we're gonna reverse that. We want our scent to blow into there. We want deer to be bedded here. If they're coming to this, they might come through here and go right down to that major food source. They're going through a quarter acre plot to get to a two acre. That means it's a true hunting parcel or hunting plot because that hunting plot represents a pass through on the way to an actual holding plot. Holding plot's different than destination. Destination, I want to be down here on the neighbors. Their, does it make sense their feeders were destination food sources? Meaning the deer arrive there after dark and they, they hit their, and they hit those feeders after dark. Holding plots are those big plots that hold deer in them until dark and then they're released to neighboring properties, to destination food sources. Could be an ag field. A lot of ag fields are destination food sources. It's safe, it's social, it's open, and they just go to the ag field the moment after dark. Again, the large portion, even if a mature doe only has a home range of a half a square mile compared to a buck at three square miles, then she still is going and expressing most of that range after dark, same with a buck. You just wanna maintain that two to 400 yards for a buck in an average ag setting like this, and then that 50 to 100 yards for a doe compared to that food source they relate to. If you're not spooking out the food source, they'll be there. And then you could have those does layered here and then bucks behind them. In this case, you would have a lot of area left over for bucks into this. Probably half of that 160 acres is for buck only. Think about that. 80 acres on 235. 80 acres designated to does now, where before there were zero acres that you designated to anything. And that's where the potential on a property like this is far, far higher than most clients realize because they just haven't experienced a property like this. That's what we do in Wisconsin. This is what we do in Minnesota on the properties that I manage and hunt myself. This is what we tell our successful clients that work hard. I tell them to do as much as you can the first year and then take a break the second year if you really want to because you get so much success when you put the time in and the effort that it's worth it and you see that, but guess what mostly happens? They do a lot of work that first year, they find a huge level of success they've never experienced, they take that potential level from a one to a five out of 10, they wanna capture that remaining five out of 10 because they're so excited. So they end up doing a lot of work the second year. I have a lot of clients that Two years later, they've done 90% of the work because they're excited, they see the results, and it's changed their hunt for the rest of their life. I hope there's some things that you can add here, and I'm gonna ask you Dylan in a second if there's anything else, but um, I'm hoping there's some things that you can add and look at, that you can look at your own property and say, I can add this feature or concept to mine. There's some of these concepts you have to have. You have to have that depth of cover so that bucks have enough room to layer in on the property behind does. That means you have to have that consistent food source that's not changing. You have to have consistent quality cover that's not changing, meaning it's not being pressured. You're not hunting or pressuring it. Then you can layer those deer. So you have to have that food and cover. That food has to be consistent in diversity throughout the entire parcel, not different food in different locations, or you destroy the entire property. Your access has to be to the outside. It might be that their cabin is right here. Then they're just working to the outside. You'd have a central lane coming in and then you work out. So you'd take out a bubble right here of efficiency of 30, 40 acres, but you'd still be able to manage and still have 130, 40 acres that's designated to all deer all the time. In a case like that, you just reverse things a little bit. And then also one of the tests, you know, I talk about my web class series for designing your your whitetail parcel, so many people have taken advantage of that, several hundred people. But you look at that, one of the tests, and one of the biggest tests is, do you have defined AM and PM stands? Do you have stands that you can say, this is definitely a PM stand right here, and this is definitely an AM? If you do, you're on the right track. If you can justify that, say, well, I'm accessing down the road, coming in, I'm tapping into the side of this property, there's likely deer bedded around there, and, and there's some hillside going down, you can blow your scent off, there's some hill blocking right here. There's some topography change that you can't see here. I'm just looking, trying to get you to look at it 2D to make some sense of it. But, um, but if you follow those concepts, there's so much potential that you can seize on your own land. Again, this doesn't matter if it's 40 acres, you'd still designate 28 to 30 acres for all deer all the time. Think about this parcel, 235. It didn't have 28 acres designated to all deer all the time. It didn't have 28 acres of true sanctuary. So a lot of people haven't experienced 20 acres, even on a 200 acre parcel, let alone 30 acres on a 40. And that's where the potential comes in. We squeeze every acre we can get out of 30 acres of cover and 12 acres of fields that we have that we hunt in, in Wisconsin. We're getting we're making our 40 acre parcel appear like a lot of the 500 acres or 400 parcel acres parcels in the area because if 
those 500 acre parcels are driven through with ATVs. If they don't have consistent food in each location, if they don't have consistent cover, if they're pressuring certain areas more than others, then all of a sudden you take 500 acres, they really only have zero or 10 acres that are designated all deer all the time. And that level of efficiency is where the power of your property comes in. And that's where you can use your resources wisely to make sure that you're grasping your potential. And when you, re when you realize your potential that you have on your land, I can tell you about 99 out of 100% of all people, 99 of 100, the potential that they can seize is several times more than they could ever imagine. Dylan. Can you think of anything that you'd like to add? Because there's, I it's, know... It's very difficult, like, without seeing it, without knowing how the topography lies, that kind of thing. But, you know, just one very small minor detail, I think I would add would be along that kind of clover road that you're talking down there. Mm -hmm. To me, it looks like a great opportunity for a water hole along there. Just, you know, if you can get in there in an afternoon to sit as they're either coming to that food or, you know, either sneaking back into uh, bed. In the you know, know what's funny about that, Dylan? Check out... Uh, Check out stand number eight right here. <laughs> <laughs> you had a water hole at it? Yeah. <laughs> See? Great minds think yeah. like. No, so think that stand we had one. So that's that's funny. It's, it's kind of, that's what I said. That's why I want Dylan to try to point things out because, you know, this was a two-hour conversation after I drew up the plan at the end of the night with the clients. And so a lot of thought goes in through this the day. It took an hour and a half to draw it out. A lot of thought going in then. A lot of thought goes into in the morning. And then, of course, when we talk about it. You think of anything else? That was a I great observation. This, this is a really, really, um, you know, picture perfect illustration of paralleling habitat features. You know, just the way that it w lied previously and the way it will once they move this food around and how it, you know, pulls deer to the edges, but, you know, it doesn't send them across onto the neighbors. I think this is a really good illustra illustration of that. I'm excited about, you know, really, they didn't have a lot of color, cover devoted deer. When they're down on a food plot right here, they could look over to the edge over here. And so by thickening that area, adding those pockets of switch, pollinator blends, can you imagine all the rabbits and pheasants they can oh, have yeah. on the land now? Yeah. Yeah. Pheasants was something they wanted to have on the property or try to get established. But uh, the amount of cover that they can devote on the middle and then have great access and, and food source locations and wooded morning stand locations, sure. it's it's... So you guys, I appreciate you guys having me out to this land, you know, um, last week, my last client in Ohio, and uh, appreciate the hospitality there and show me the pictures of that massive giant buck <laughs> that was shot a few years on the property and the existing ones you have right now. So it's a special property. I actually had um, the majority of my properties in that last Ohio trip I look at and think, you know, Ohio is a place I wouldn't mind owning land someday. Um, a smaller chunk and there were several smaller chunks in there that i think man i'd love this parcel and i go to the next day i'd love this parcel i don't know if you ever do that dylan but oh, it's kind of every time yeah. <laughs> yeah man i would love to own this piece yeah, yeah. <laughs> and especially those smaller ones because there's something to be said for taking a 40 50 60 acre parcel and turning it into an efficiency level of 30 40 50 acres and seeing what happens in that area that already has monsters. And so that whole east portion of Ohio and south portion, we get to go, I've gone to so many different big buck states, Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, Kentucky, but that portion of Ohio is a special area, you know, even considering all the other ones too. So anyways, I hope you guys can take back something from this. And, uh, and uh, I like that Dylan pointed out that water hole because that is another, it's, you know, again, we're looking for dry areas that we can stick water holes for that opportunity because they can be a powerful uh, rut hunting magnet, let alone uh, during hot portions in October. And it's crazy when it warms up a little bit in December, any open water just gets flocked to a deer. So it's pretty cool. But uh, anyways, hope you can take some of this back with you. Thank you to the guys in Ohio for having me out on this 10th this, uh, property I went to. Uh, during the uh, during the last visit and client trip in January and uh, hope you guys have a great season what's cool about this all these changes can be made this year for a huge increase in potential and enjoyment of the hunt just this fall this is not I repeat this is not something that takes five six seven years if someone's telling you that that's how long it's going to take they're doing it wrong simply because it shouldn't take that long at all if you can do the work, if you have the resources of time, and this is like a little hunt club. So they have the resources of time and money to get it done. And I, hopefully they will this year because I wanna hear good things about it. And I wanna hear good things from you about your land this coming hunting season. Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your 
food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.